Great, thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Tamar Tofik. I'm one of the Spine Fellows here. So we'll just go over a brief trauma case that I thought had a couple good teaching points. Um, so 55-year-old Alaska male from Juneau um, who was found drunk after a possible altercation. Um, what I was told is that he initially had, quote unquote, a central cord where he had uh, a little bit of um, uh, decreased weakness in his upper extremities relative to his lower extremities. Um, he apparently was placed in a collar, uh, but was supposedly non-compliant. Uh, and some, when I interviewed some of the family members, they told me that while they were manipulating him, the patient was just in agony. So I'll show you his initial, his initial um, CT scan. Is your video clip working? Great. So I'm going to just put this on. Let's start with Dr. Daly, the far right, and then we'll go to the far left with Larry. So you're the far right. You're the red state uh, respondent. So comment as you're uh, having this video go past you. Well, it looks like, you know, sagittally he's relatively in alignment, but he has quite a bit of flowing osteophyte and has, you know, dish. And you worry about, in that situation, a hyperextension injury, and, you know, that could be a cult. And, you know, he's sort of relocated the thing. I'm particularly worried, as I go through that thing, what's happening between C3 and C4. And is that a hyperextension injury that we're just not seeing? All right, pass, pass on to Tim. Blowing thoughts, any questions to Tamar? He can answer them. He knows the patient well. No, I mean, I agree with what Andrew said. You know, I think that this is a, you know, this is a situation that have a high index of suspicion and, and, and needs more imaging, you know, you know, for the possible. more imaging. Cool. This is the eternal well. thing. Would you want a sacral CT or? No, I'd want an MRI scan. Just I mean, MRI? no, no, I'd want an MRI. Scan. Yeah, you know, so. Not MRI. MRI. So, no, just an MRI. It's an MRI. You know, so so and and. But he's and, neurologically and, intact. Not yeah, central, that's not like that's either. I mean, you know, right? So, quote unquote, central cord initially. An MRI? Sure. All right. We'll so, an MRI. so, an MRI. so apparently, um, you know, during the midst of this scan and uh, later on through the night and into the morning, when they examine the patient, the patient uh, declined neurologically, and that's what we get. So John, what happened there? So this was how many hours between the CT uh, relative and MRI? About 24 hours. And so well, actually, less than 12, actually. And the patient was immobilized how? Uh, with a quote unquote soft collar. So John, what's going on there? Well, what actually, was... yeah, let me correct myself. He had a hard collar, but he was complaining about it. So the hospital medicine uh, physician put him in a soft collar to make him more comfortable. Well, you said he was not compliant earlier in the presentation. Correct, right. It's it's hard always on the MRI to see, but it looks to me like he's jumped both facets completely. So now at four five. Four said C four five was a problem. No C three. Three four. No, this is four five. Yeah. So go back to that again. I was guessing three four as well based on the CAT scan, but so he's jumped unilaterally. The set joints there. The, the C four five facet joint. There's a little gap there on one side. I'm sorry, the C4-5 facet joint looked a little gapped on one side. Right. I, I think now counting again, I mean, I'd have to like yeah. slowly. No, I mean, that's correct. I mean, C4-5 clearly when, when I was looking at it looked a little bit um, suspicious relative to all the other. Uh, You're stopping short. Go, I'm not convinced. Show me. I, I'm. So I'll show you again. So I don't know. That's a pretty tough call. Right. It's, I think it's on this so th again, this is a guy. Stop right there. Oh, but if you look, yeah. Okay. Go um, I don't know. So I, I think three, four is suspicious, but there's clearly a fracture anteriorly at four, five. You can see it. Go back through it. Through the, the posterior element's hard to see. Like that little chip off the back of the facet might represent something. I think this is the uh, right there's fracture. Go to the next one. Keep going. You can see. Look right there. It's not not corticated. That's I think the suspicious thing, and and these elderly people or these ankylos, that right there, that fracture right there, yeah, and that's really suspicious for that being a bad problem. Absolutely. So Tamer, go over the neurologic exam. So he's screaming in pain. He is the usual conundrum of mind altering substances and beverages, and whatever. Right. Um, so. So what was his actual motor score? What was his reflex status? Let's go over that again. Right. So when I so this patient was, you know, when I saw the initial image and the subsequent MRI, he was flown in from Juno uh, and brought into the ICU. <clears throat> when I 
initially saw him, he was in Asia A, C3 sensory level, um, a reflexic, no record. When he was, when this CT was obtained, what is this the best reconstruction? Uh, this, he was, basically what they told me was he had a little bit of weakness in his upper extremities, lower extremities were perfectly fine. No hyperreflexia that we have recorded? No. Maybe not done. So you two are, just like everybody here, men of absolute integrity. Honestly, so this is a guy who's just waking up from a lot of booze and whatever, and this is the CT scan. What would you have honestly done? You see that a catastrophe is about to happen, but honestly, what would you do? I think there's a good, I think that we, we could potentially just brace the patient and ended up with the same results. Uh, hopefully, we would have maybe had the patient be compliant with the heart collar, ideally, but I think at this stage, without the MRI, um, at least our suspicion for sort of a significant three column injury were moderate to low. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really, I'd be suspicious of this. I would MRI him. Ankylose spines, particularly the actual disease of ankylosing spondylitis, notoriously subtle. CT findings, and so if I'm suspicious, a lot of pain, that patient gets an MRI. Soft collar is a meaningless tool. We might as well not put anything on it, and I think we have to resist the temptation to make the patient happy, because uh, this patient will not remember the fact that you made him happy, and it was him complaining that you switched him to a soft collar. He'll just remember that you did a, did a bad job, so don't, you know, I would have made him stay in a hard collar. I'd have been suspicious. I would MRI that. Even if I didn't see that crack, I would MRI him because of his pain. I, I would just say for the record, I don't think a hard collar is going to do much here either. Well, if you look at his chin, he's got not much of a chin there, and I can just see it slipping down behind that collar. So, Ed, you've been asked to arbitrate in these kind of difficult situations more than once. Um, was this malpractice here? I'm just going to be very careful. This is this deviation of standard of care. Is this something that somebody should have had the prescience to intervene right then and there? Was it a mistake to not get an MRI scan right then and there for this kind of an ankylosing rotten spine? I'm no expert on that, Jens. I mean, I'm reminded of the guy from Bellevue that had a thoracic injury about two years ago and, and uh, went in and out of the ER with ankylosing spondylitis and ended up paraplegic. Largely the same thing, and I think John's comment is really true that you, once you see anterior ossification to that degree, you've got to assume that you can't see a lot of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Should we just get a screening MRI on those patients then? Yeah, I mean, so the one comment that I would make, even, even though we say there's subtle changes, it worries us, these are not common injuries. You and I recognize this. Is it the, I mean, and, and I would love to say that the guy in the ER in a small hospital is obliged to know this, and we should try to teach him that and learn it. Them missing this fracture, our radiologists miss these things. Them missing this fracture, I don't know that it's below standard of care. It's, it's a horrible catastrophe, but it, it's so uncommon that we should do everything we can to teach them. Can they know the subtle of this like you and I know it? I, I don't know that they can be held to that standard. I'm not sure. Because one of the things that I was always taught is if there's a significant cervical injury especially, there'll be some soft tissue trauma, right? There'll be some bleeding or something somewhere. And I mean, there's nothing there. Andrew, do you want to pass that the right wing microphone? I, mean, I agree with John. How are you going to know that without getting an MRI to look for edema in the end plates, right. to look for, you know, potentially gapping or injury to the facet joints posteriorly? I mean, I think, you know, these are these are not common patients. And the downside of getting an, more information in somebody with DISH or ankylosing spondylitis is none. It really isn't. I mean, you could always say the theoretical risk of transferring them to the MR scanner. But I think, you know, getting more information in these patients is always key. Now, a lot of these injuries, this patient happened in Alaska, and Alaska is a whole nation unto itself. I mean, so if this happens in somewhere, Kotzebue, um, and he needs to be airlifted, uh, right, Kim, to Anchorage to see you, this is a four-hour flight again, right, with about two transfers in between. So how do you transfer somebody like that? It, it, this is non-displaced at this point in time. There's a suspicion of a fracture. We all now agree.
yep, there's something here, and uh, whoop, not so sure about that. Um, so, so how do we mobilize this patient? How do we transfer him to get that done? I mean, this, so this is a real problem. Yeah, That's a really big issue. What I've always been taught is if, if someone comes in with a spine fracture and any type of neurological um, deterioration from baseline, I mean, he buys himself an MRI. So I think that's the one thing that we can all agree on that was kind of an omission, that there yeah. was an altered neuro exam that was vaguely documented. And again, I think everybody agrees with that. Now we have the catastrophe. So we all want to get to lunch. And uh, John Hurlbert, you're our cord expert. So do you want to switch to the MRI? So the fait accompli has happened. There is a absolute horror. And again, go over the exam at this point in time now. So, um, when I initially saw the patient, he was in Asia A, C3, motor level complete, uh, no rectal tone, uh, no movement of his upper or lower extremities, uh, essentially vent dependent. So John, I gather from your lecture this morning where you posted a picture of Michael Failings with a no through it, that steroids are not uh, in your uh, armamentarium anymore, right? Not for trauma. I don't, I don't think. So what are you going to do now? So blood pressure, normalization, hematocrit above 30, all that. But traction, what else? Try and reduce him. So cranial traction, reduce him. How many pounds and uh, how far are you going to take that? I mean, this guy is now 24 hours out. I'd start with 15, go up by five. Some, some people would just do it manually in the ER, and that's, that's okay too. But he's highly unstable, right? Okay. Who'd have guessed? So... In all honesty, would you still give steroids? Shock trauma? Do you guys give steroids? Desperate situation. Probably not. How would you intubate this patient? <laughs> He's not intubated yet, right? Uh, when he initially came, he was not. I mean, I mean, obviously, this would be like an awake fiber optic intubation. Um, I mean, obviously, you would worry about even the intubation could even cause severe trauma because he's already he's in Asia A right now, or he just correct Asia, yeah. So, I mean, we'd still try to do a weak fiber optic intubation and take him to the OR. John, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 same thing. I mean, this is one you really have to be careful because I would reduce it in traction, like John. You got to be really careful. This one will over distract. So I would go slow. This is the exact one. It's not like the jump facet of a young patient. This will distract, like distracting a long bone femur. Um, I think you, you probably are, you know, once you intubate this patient, you might as well start to prep for the trach and prepare for it because he's going to get a trach. I wouldn't do it right away, but I would fiber optic intubate him and uh, reduce him and then, then you plan to fix him. Tim, can you take the right wing sure. microphone? So you showed a nearly similar case before. So can you talk us through this now? Well, so. you know, so, so, so I would differ a little bit, and, you know, and I'm probably going to get, you know, roundly criticized, but I don't think I would, I would, I would take the time to go through a, through a, a pre-surgical realignment. I think I think I would I would I would take him to surgery and realign him there because what's going to change? I mean, he's right. he's an Asia A, he's a C three. You know, well, for you for know, one your, thing, your argument of a big disc herniation, he's not going to get a big disc herniation. He's got disc. He doesn't have much of a disc there. So. How's your OR availability? It's just well, and, well and, and that's my other point is that I can do the, I can get them to the operating room, my institution, and get them realigned surgically much faster than I can get them realigned pre-surgically by you know fluoro or, or or you know some sort of serial X-ray thing with palms on, and so so I think if there's any you know if if, if I'm going to do anything, you know to, or any you know realign if I think realignment is really important, I, I'm actually more 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 likely to in this situation to take him to surgery and, and just do it all at once. So I have a question for Harvard here. So this guy over there on the right side, Andrew Daly, he created the traction cart, and created the fluoro suite for traction reductions. Does that still exist? It does. Um, we had a case very similar to this not too long ago, and we did close reduction in the PACU, uh, got a good reduction, and put him in a collar, and then took him to surgery later. So it still exists. Andrew, your legacy lives on. Uh, John, you're going to say something? I think it really is a hospital to hospital logistical thing. And for me, it may matter when they came in and what time it was, because if I reduce this, which we can usually do pretty quickly, then everything can slow down. And if it's one in the morning, I can do it with a decent team. If it was midnight and I had the ortho people were on call and I had the good team, you know, you could do it. You could take them right to the OR. But I, I would hate to do this with the, the gynae team at one in the morning. And so if I reduce it, 
I, it can all slow down and I can put it on first thing in the morning in the trauma room. So we have a colleague from Germany here from the University of Aachen, which is in northern Germany. It's a spectacular hospital. It's like a UFO that landed. So you have everything in the world, and you have navigation 24 hours probably to just find the way to the bathroom probably. But um, how do you uh, handle this now? And tell us your name again. Yeah, my name is Philip Kobe. Hi. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot. So we would handle this as an emergency. So we try to get every patient patient as soon as possible in the OR. And in our setting, that would be within one hour. So we would not wait until the next morning. And um, I just want to make also one comment to the color, because we were talking about the hard or soft color. I think especially in those ankylizing spines, you also have to be very careful with hard colors, because sometimes they're in kyphosis. And then you can really dislocate the whole cervical spine if you put them in a hard color. So you have to be very careful with those colors. And um, as I said, we wouldn't wait. We would go in the OR right away with them. So I love that statement of you got to be really careful. I always like that because it's obviously a common statement. But what do you really do? So if you have somebody who has this neck kyphotic and this looks pretty ugly and suspicious for a fracture, what is your alternative to a hard collar? No, I, I would use a hard collar, but I would get definitely an X-ray or maybe even a CT scan right away after putting that hard collar on. What we used to do is we used to put uh, sand sacks on them. I don't know whether you still do it at Harborview. We actually literally padded them and put a strip around them, do not remove, until we had surgical stabilization. So uh, we did a workaround because I agree. This is a great point you make. The hard collars are potentially dangerous leverage instrument, uh, instrument just as um, uh, prone positioning on a Jackson table. Um, Amir, what do you do in Louisiana? So you guys had a major combat center there called uh, Charity. So uh, first of all, going back, did this tip you off in all honesty? You're a brutally honest guy also. Was this fracture something that is suspicious to you to get an MRI? We all agreed the neuro status was kind of suspicious, but how would this have been handled in the, in the Charity uh, Institution combat zone? So pretty much uh, this patient would come in with a hard collar on. Uh, they're pretty aggressive out in the field um, in Louisiana in terms of there are actual physicians that ride around in the ambulances and uh, they're very defensive about that and they until they either have a MRI or a normal neurologic exam done by someone who's qualified to do it um, and has cleared them, um, they're in a hard collar right away. Um, so usually by the time they make it to the trauma bay, it's not really on us to do it. Um, it's already been done for us um, so it's it's less of an issue in terms of placing it um, but in in you know in terms of getting them going you know uh, people obviously can miss this um, radiologists I'm sure but uh, anytime you have an ankylo spine, whether it's AS or DISH, um, you just have to have that on your radar. Um, whether you know it's and that's why we get consulted for these things. So we have five minutes to wrap up here. Linda told me lunch is waiting and steaming. So Tamara, take us forward. Sure. So um, uh, initially, um, you know, we, we treated this right away as, as if it was an emergency, and we did not. Um, uh, preoperatively uh, reduce this patient. We figured, you know, let's get him into the OR as fast as we can and let's try to reduce him. So these are uh, with essentially with, with cast bar pins. So uh, it, it initially appeared that, um, you know, we had good fixation at 4-5 uh, with the plan on going, um, obviously, posteriorly because this is not uh, necessarily a single stage um, procedure. Um, but initially on the films, it looked like, um, you know, he was reduced and everything looked good. This is our CT. And when we got our CT, we noticed that he was still jumped. So technical pointers. Andrew, you talked about that yesterday. One thing, you know, the nice thing about the O-arm is you can get intraoperative CT scans to make sure that somebody's reduced if you can't see it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, um, I mean, at four or five, it seems like you could probably get a pretty good lateral view. So, uh, you know, really tape the shoulders down and so forth and try to really work for that lateral view. John Herbert, does this matter now? I mean, the canal is relatively decompressed. Oh, that's what I was thinking. I, I think a totally acceptable option here is just to go posterior, do your laminectomy, and fuse in situ. Looking at the cord signal now, worried? What's his prognosis? Oh, I think it's 
not so much the cord signal, it's his Asia A status, his, his prognosis is bad. We had Bijan Arabi here last year, and he identified the length of the cord signal as being prognostically adverse, but this doesn't look that bad, right? What happened next? Uh, and then we took him posteriorly um, and basically essentially did a C3 to C6 laminectomy and fused him C2 to T2. Um, and he's still jumped. I mean, I think that facet should have been uh, drilled out, but. But it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So the patient remained Asia A the whole time? Correct. Moda score zero almost, or? Yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, he remained intubated, um, really um, essentially became, uh, he developed pneumonias, became septic, required pressors. Uh, at that point, we initiated a family discussion, and, um, you know, I, I, I've, was pretty straightforward with them and told them that this patient is most likely going to be uh, required trach and peg. Uh, so they decided to uh, withdraw on this patient. So as a serious spinal cord injury, and John, I was just going to come to you to give us a big picture perspective. What are the lessons learned? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know. I think with ankylosed spines, we've kind of beat that. You got to be really cautious. Uh, you know, there's not, there's not much you can do. There's various ways to treat this. One of the questions I wanted to ask was, what's your experience with diaphragmatic pacers in patients with fractures above the level of the diaphragmatic roots? In other words, C4, this C5 and up, are you using any diaphragmatic pacers? It, you know, it sounds like this went bad before that. Not a big series here. I don't know how it is at Harborview now. Do you have pacers routinely now? No. Yeah, we've had two or three patients here, but uh, not too many. Andrew? There, yeah, we're, we're actually starting to put them in really early. And there's some evidence to suggest that you can get some of these patients off a ventilator uh, if you get a diaphragmatic pacer working and, and sort of pace them, that they'll start, you know, their diaphragm will start working again if you get it in early. I mean, it's class three evidence. I mean, literally the next day, they got in the chair breathing off the vent, and they have to wean them in. It's been pretty dramatic in the other patients. Right. So let's um, hold this thought. Oh, John. Just just one last thing, closing, and only only because those of us that have been doing this for 20 years have all seen it. I just hope nobody in this room would ever get up and say that this could have been avoided if this patient had been properly treated, because I'm still not convinced that this could have been avoided. And in a court of law, those are very damaging things to say, and I hope nobody feels that way here.